Hola amigos, buen día. Today we are back in Plaza Pedro del Castillo, the founding area of Mendoza, the original foundation area where we were in our first video. And right nearby, over here, is a park, beautiful Parque Bernardo O'Higgins, which is where we are going to talk about the long and storied relationship and the history between Argentina and Chile. Come along. Before we do that, I just want to say real quick thank you very much for watching the video. Click the like button and the subscribe button and leave a comment down below. It's free, it's easy, and it will help the channel grow and help this content reach other YouTube viewers. All right, back to the video. So why did we choose Parque Bernardo O'Higgins to be the place where we talked about Chile and Argentina? Well, because Bernardo O'Higgins is a very famous uh, hero of liberation in South America. And uh, he's from Chile. And as we mentioned in our video about the uh, plazas, the four central plazas of, uh, or five central plazas of Mendoza, Argentina, Bernardo O'Higgins, he's right there on the statue in Plaza Chile, right next to uh, Jose de San Martin, holding that sword together. And O'Higgins, after losing a battle against the Spanish in Chile, retreated back over the Andes, ended up in Mendoza, helped San Mar Jose de San Martin uh, raise the army of the Andes, march back over to Chile, start an insurrection, kick the Spanish out, um, at which point they were able to uh, raise a navy and sail that up to Peru, kick some ass there too. So that's why this is the perfect place to be talking about this. Normally I'd be doing this video as a walk and talk through the park, which we're doing right now, of course, showing off the nice park, the playground equipment over here for the kids. Uh, but we're not going to do that the entire time. Why? Well, because it is exceptionally hot today. For all my American viewers, it is over 100 degrees right now. And for literally everybody else in the world, it's like 40 degrees. Uh, so it's very hot. Probably for a lot of this, I'm going to be finding a nice shady spot where we can sit and talk. But I did want to show off the park a little bit before we did that. So as we learned from our video about San Martin, link to that down in the description by the way, the independence of Argentina and Chile, the histories are very, very closely aligned. Um, they happened within a few years of each other. The main players were the same in both, uh, both histories. And for a while, the history specifically of Mendoza, for a long while before Argentine and Chilean independence, uh, the history of Mendoza was closely, closely tied to Chile because uh, this whole area back in the Spanish colonial days in the 1500s, 1600s, it was the vice royalty of Peru. And within the vice royalty of Peru, there were like different subdivisions. One of them was the kingdom of Chile. And this province, Cusho province, was part of the kingdom of Chile. Mendoza city was part of Chile for like 200 years before the creation of the vice royalty Rio de la Plata, which is modern-day Argentina. When that happened, this province, Cujo province, now Mendoza province, was split off and it joined uh, vice royalty of uh, Rio de la Plata. And Mendoza was a really important geographical city. Um, it was important because the Andes Mountains, uh, in order to cross them, you have to cross during the summer. There's only certain times you can cross the Andes Mountains. I mean. Uh, the passes get snowed in and you can't cross during the winter. So for uh, caravans, trade caravans that were coming from Buenos Aires, um, from things that were being shipped over across the ocean, they, to make, in order to make their way all the way out to Chile, to Santiago, they either had to go you know, sail all the way around the southern tip of, um, of South America, or they could make a land route from the eastern part of Argentina all the way over here and then cross the Andes Mountains to Chile. Now, in order to do that, they would need basically an area, a town, where they could sort of restock and uh, get ready to cross the Andes because it's a big deal crossing those mountains, especially back in the uh, you know Spanish colonial days, was a very big deal. And that's what Mendoza was. Mendoza was basically created as a city or a town where you could, your, your, your trade caravan could sort of stop and um, re, restock and rest up 
and get ready for the treacherous journey across the Andes over into uh, like Santiago, Chile. Found this nice spot in the shade here, Bernardo Higgins Park, Parque de Bernardo Higgins. Beautiful green space over here. There's like a, you can see all these trees lining over here is like a pedestrian walk that goes through the entire park. And then behind me, there is like a skate park through this fence, of course. But there's a skate park with like a, an amphitheater over there behind it. And they have, uh, you know, outdoor concerts and things like that out here. There's a big skate park. Nobody's skating, of course, because it's blazing hot today. Uh, but I just wanted to show off this park before we talk a little bit more about Chile and Argentina. And after both countries, Chile and Argentina, were independent from Spain in the, uh, you know, 1820s, uh, there were a series of civil wars across Latin America. Latin American independence is not like a clean-cut uh, situation. Uh, afterwards, there were, there were factions from different provinces fighting against each other. There were factions within provinces fighting against each other. There were factions um, in different countries fighting against each other. There, there was a long history of uh, internal conflict and civil war leading up to sort of the unification of different countries, which happened at different times in, uh, in the history of Latin America. So it's important to remember that <laughs> once everyone was, uh, you know, independent from Spain and uh, the battles for liberation had been fought and won, uh, it wasn't just like that was the end of the war. There were plenty of other wars and conflicts that happened after that. For example, here in Mendoza, in Cusho province, there in the 1830s was a movement to, to leave and to uh, reunite with Chile. Uh, it was a situation that ended with a large battle fought here in which many, many members of the uh, aristocracy here in, in uh, Mendoza ended up having to flee to Chile and Buenos Aires, the most powerful of the provinces, the Argentine provinces at the time, really clamped down here in Mendoza. Um, there's a complicated history between Mendoza and, Ar and uh, Buenos Aires because for a long time, up until 1885, when they ran the railroad out here, Mendoza was very disconnected from the other provinces in Argentina. So even after the formation of the Argentine Confederation, um, there, and, and the end of the Argentine civil wars, Mendoza was, was relatively um, isolated out here. Let's get up and walk, talk a little bit more. So during the 1800s, there were a lot of uh, border skirmishes and border disputes back and forth between Chile and Argentina. Chile and Argentina have the third longest international border in the world. Uh, it's the only longer ones are between Russia and Kazakhstan and then between the United States and Canada. It's an extremely long border and it's been contested and even to this day is still there are still contested areas, areas that are um, that are in dispute. Uh, even though relationship between Argentina and Chile is much better now than it has been in the past. But during the 1800s there were a lot of disputes over the border not just between the land border, but also the, uh, the channel, the Beagle Channel, called such because the, uh, the ship, the Beagle, famous for carrying Charles Darwin through South America, uh, charted that channel. And it's the channel way down south, southern tip of uh, South America, in between Chile and Argentina. And there were disputes over all of these things until 1881. And that's when they signed a treaty that's pretty much more or less defined who had rights to uh, to what land along the border and along that channel. And one of the things about why they signed that treaty in 1881 and why Chile specifically, why they were ready at that time to sign a treaty, is because Chile was actually fighting a war against Bolivia and Peru, the War of the Pacific. And this is a war that not a lot of people I don't think know about. I mean, of course, people in Chile and Peru and Bolivia do. But it is uh, a war that had actually very serious consequences, specifically and especially for Bolivia. If you look on a map, you'll notice that Bolivia is a landlocked country. 
that was not always the case. Bolivia used to have access to the Pacific Ocean. And now the area of Chile that borders Bolivia, well, that wasn't always Chile, <laughs> that was Bolivia. And after the War of the Pacific, uh, in I believe 1884, 1887, when it ended, uh, the territories were redrawn and Chile ended up taking territory from both Peru and Bolivia. Now, there's still a lot of bad blood between those three countries, but it specifically affected Bolivia the worst because Bolivia went from being a country with access to an ocean to being a completely landlocked country and that forever changed the development of Bolivia moving forward. But getting off onto a bit of a tangent here, we're supposed to be talking about Chile and Argentina. And like I said in 1881, they signed a treaty that basically defined the borders and they had a relative peace between the country for, for quite some time. Um, you know, there were a few things here and there where, you know, a map would be drawn and some of the territories would be, you know, claimed as Argentine or claimed as Chilean and it would lead to you know, a little bit of a diplomatic skirmish over it. But for the most part, uh, pretty good relations all the way up until the late 20th century. Interesting side note about the war in the Pacific between Bolivia, Peru, and Chile is that there was an Argentine volunteer who was volunteering for the Peruvians who was captured by the Chileans. His name was Roque Sanz Peña, and he was Argentine, and after what came close to being a very serious diplomatic incident, he was returned and repatriated back to Argentina, and he later went on to become the president of Argentina. And even though there were some diplomatic incidents like that, like I said, largely up until the late 20th century, the relationship between Argentina and Chile was, uh, was pretty peaceful. Now, they did almost, almost get into a war, and that occurred in 1978. It's called the Beagle Channel Incident. It's the Beagle Channel that we had mentioned uh, where the water channel in the very southern tip of South America between Argentina and Chile. And it has been disputed for quite some time. Uh, it had been disputed all the way back since, you know, the, uh, the 1800s. But in 1978, both countries were under the rule of military dictatorships. The Pinochet regime in Chile and the uh, military junta that we spoke about in previous videos in Argentina. Now, both of these were far right-wing dictatorships that were propped up by the United States during the Cold War. And uh, they were, like most military dictatorships, very militaristic. And they almost got into a war over the Beagle Channel. It came very close. So close that the ships of the navies were sailing towards each other and about to fight. And it's only because of intervention from the Vatican that prevented uh, an all-out war. And at the very, very last minute, the navies backed off and the channel still remained disputed up until 1984. Now, in 84, Pinochet was still in power in Chile, but the junta here in Argentina, after their loss in the Malvinas conflict, which we've made videos about, link in the description, uh, they, they lost um, power in Argentina and a democratically elected president signed a treaty with, uh, with Chile. And that treaty stands to this day and it defines the uh, territories that are Chilean and the territories that are Argentine with relationship to the Beagle Channel and the islands that are around there in the southern part of South America. In 1989, Pinochet's regime gave way to democratic elections in Chile, and now with both countries democratic, the tensions eased and the relationship continued to get better and better. Today, Argentina and Chile are major economic part partners and diplomatic, diplomatically friendly. There is a large population of Chileans living in Argentina. There is a large population of Argentines living in Chile. Uh, the borders are open and people cross, uh, cross the borders quite often. One uh, sticking point that still uh, causes a little bit of bad blood to this day is there is a flight that leaves once a month from Chile 
to the Falkland Islands slash Malvinas Islands. And there are Chileans who work on the islands. And this flight is really the only way that people get from mainland South America over to the islands. And it is the only way that Argentine war veterans who want to visit the islands in order to visit the Argentine war memorial on the islands um, can get there. And there was, during the, uh, the presidency of uh, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner a few years ago, there was um, some thought that she was going to try and pressure uh, the Chilean government into either stopping that flight or restricting that flight in some way. Um, but it didn't end up happening. It's still a flight that happens once a month from Chile to the Falklands slash Malvinas Islands. And Chile actually has a very, very close relationship with the United Kingdom, um, which is a bit of a diplomatic uh, tightrope that they have to walk because they do technically recognize Argentine sovereignty over the Malvinas slash Falkland Islands. Um, but they also have a very, very close relationship with the United Kingdom, and they are, it's something that they definitely don't want to, uh, to give up because the countries during the 20th century had taken two sort of different economic paths. Um, Argentina largely tried to industrialize, and in order to protect their industrial in industries here in Argentina, they created a lot of tariffs to trade. Um, which made trade harder with uh, other countries. During that time, Chile opened up more free trade policies with Europe and with the United States and with later uh, with China also. Argentina formed a trade union, Mercosur, with Brazil, uh, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Also Venezuela, who has recently been removed due to uh, certain economic problems in Venezuela. Uh, and the sanctions that have been put on them. But uh, Chile is an associate member of Mercosur, but not a full member. Um, and so Chile still maintains a lot of um, trade relationships with uh, other countries outside of South America, whereas Argentina has closer relationships trade-wise with countries in South America. But all in all, even though there is still a bit of a rivalry between Chile and Argentina, Chilenos and Argentines, the relationship for the most part is very friendly good diplomatic relations, uh, a good economic relationship, and, like I mentioned, populations from the different countries living on either side of the border. And it makes sense because they have such a close history, their independence are tied the, so closely, the two countries' independence movements. Uh, they both speak Spanish, so it makes sense that they would actually be quite friendly, and they've never actually fought a, in a war. Uh, like Chile has with Bolivia and Peru. So, that's pretty much it for the relationship between Chile and Argentina. Um, one thing that I did want to see while we were here in this area right next to Parque uh, Bernardo O'Higgins was, well, it doesn't have really anything to do with uh, the relationship between Chile and Argentina, but we're here and I want to see it and there's, there's not enough of it to put in its own video. So you know what? It's going in this video and you're all going to come with me because I have taken you hostage and there's nothing you can do about it. Actually, you could probably click off the video, but don't do that. Don't, don't click off the video. This is going to be cool. Trust me, you're going to like it. We're here at the southern part, the like, southern tip of the park. And right here, this is the Centro para la Conservación de la Biodiversidad. Anyway, this is like a bio diversity center, uh, which used to be open to the public, unfortunately is no longer open to the public. It was an aquarium where you could go and see fish swimming around. And I really wanted to see that, but like I said, this closed about two years ago. So why am I showing you a closed building? Well, because right across the street, there is Centro Anaconda Serpentaria. It's a Serpentario. It's a snake house. There's a, <laughs> there's a bunch of, uh, snakes and lizards and uh, I don't know, I think tarantulas and other creepy crawlers in there. So I really kind of want to go in there and see this. And uh, I think we should do it. Let's go. Let's go see the creepy crawlies. All right, so we're in. Cost 2,000 pesos to get in. Nice, nice price, about $1.80 given the current exchange rate. And here we are. 
Look, snakes. This is a Nyan Canina, a non venomous snake. He's just chilling. It's very hot, so I imagine most of these snakes are just going to be chilling, soaking up the heat. There's a python. The floor is uh, wooden planks. It's extremely creaky, and you're going to be hearing it creak while we're walking around looking at all these snakes, so apologies for that, but what can you do? Looks like this guy just shed his skin. I see his skin out here. And he is also just chilling. This guy's venomous. A cascabel. Venenosa. Oh, okay, so this is a false coral snake. Right? So this is something I learned about snakes. There's, uh, there are two kinds of snakes. There's a coral snake, and I can't remember the name of the other snake, but they kind of look like a coral snake. They have the same, um, the same coloration. And there's like a rhyme that you can say to remember which is which, and it might save your life one day. And uh, I don't remember the rhyme, so I guess if I run into a real coral snake out in the wild somewhere, I'm probably gonna die. That's disconcerting. This guy's venomous. Now I know you can tell venomous snakes because they have like a triangular shaped head. See how his head is shaped like a triangle? Yikes. We're gonna go ahead and leave that guy alone. Here's another false coral snake. This one from Honduras. They all seem to be just chilling in the water, trying to stay cool. Like I said, a very hot day. Very hot day, and it's pretty hot in here. Let's see what else we can see. This guy's non-venomous. Culebra de las Islas Tres Marias. Pretty cool looking guy. This dude, this dude just ate something. You can see it, like, <laughs> moving through. He's digesting something. Crazy. Crazy. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that you started off your day with a video about the history of Argentina and Chile, and you ended up watching a snake digest something? Only on this channel, let me tell you. Let's try and find something really cool. Oh, this guy's cool. It's a corn snake. It's an albino. Albino jungle corn snake. He's looking right at me. He's thinking, bro, I just want to chill and sleep in my water bowl because it's hot. Stop shoving your camera in my face. Oh, here we go. Now, I will tell you something. I kind of like snakes. I think they're cool. One thing I do not like, do not like, is spiders. But uh, we came in here to see creepy crawlies. So here they are. Spiders. Oh, man. Araña. Araña. That's that's the name for spider in Spanish. Jeez, look at these dudes. That thing is huge. It's big and it's furry and I don't like it. I don't like it uh, one bit. Oh my god. I swear to god, if one of these things moves while I'm filming, I'm just gonna freak out. We, I, I gotta get away from these things. I can't. We're, we're gonna go back to looking at snakes. I don't wanna look at spiders anymore.
look at this guy. This is a Burmese python. Wow. There's his head. Oh, well, there's his head. See him down there? Burmese pythons. Crazy. People keep these things as pets. A lot of them. There's a big problem with this in uh, down in Florida in the Everglades. People keeping Burmese pythons as pets and then they get too big and they release them out into the wild because they can't take care of them anymore and then they don't have any natural predators and they just take over the whole ecosystem. Invasive species, big problem. Definitely a big problem. Culebra de los maizales. It's like a snake of the cornfields, I guess. Pretty cool looking guy. Another false coral snake. Now the question is, do they have a real coral snake here? In amongst all these false coral snakes, I wonder. Because we saw a real coral snake, that's a uh, venomous. Oh look, our first snake that's actually moving. Hey buddy. He is a uh, boa. Boa arco iris. Cool. Just hanging out, looking around. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? He's looking right at the camera. Yep, go back in the water, buddy. Chill out. It's nice. It's hot today. Here's another one. He was moving just a second ago. I was just chilling. Well, this guy's moving around. Having a little, uh, having a little stretch. I don't know where his head is. I can't tell which end is, is the head and which end is the tail. What do we got here? Another python? This dude has a kind of a bulge in his belly, too. I think he might have just eaten something as well. I wonder how often they feed these things. I know snakes don't have to eat very often because they digest really slowly, right? Ah, uh, here we go. Boa constrictor. This guy just shed, definitely. I mean, you can see his skin right there that he shed. That's pretty cool. The way sh snakes shed their skin. It's a really cool thing. They do it pretty often, too, I think, if I remember correctly. Oh, here's another boa constrictor. Hard to see him because there's a bit of a glare. He he's chilling in there. He's just hanging out. And, uh, oh, who is this guy? A culebra verde. Green snake. Oh, this is, uh, like a native... Argentine snake. Wow, he's got a really cool pattern on him. That green pattern with like the light green stripes. Really cool. And here's a sign that says uh, that we can't drink alcohol, I guess. Well, we're Solvents, uh, gasoline, kerosene, alcoholic solvents are toxic for the digestion of... I don't quite know what this says. I think this is a sign warning that... Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what this sign is. It's very funny, though. It has a very funny, a very funny picture on it. If there's one in here, I don't think I can see him. He's he's hiding somewhere. This guy. Culebra Okiti. Non-venomous from the United States. 
Just like me, non-feminists from the United States. Oh, hey, look, this isn't a skink, or this isn't a snake at all, this is a, uh, a lizard. What's up, buddy? Just hanging out. So, I guess they have snakes, spiders, terrifying spiders that I don't like at all, and at least one lizard. Here he is, the guy that they named this place after. The Anaconda. Nope, oh, wait, where's his head? There he is. He sees us, he's looking at us. Yep, this guy, Anacondas. They made movies about you, bro. With Ice Cube, Jennifer Lopez. If you haven't seen that movie, by the way, Check it out, it's like the cheesiest schlock ever, but it's great. A ratonera? Rat snake, I guess? Albino. Look at that. Completely white, very cool. Oh, here's some more lizards. What are these? Lagarto Colorado and Lagarto Overo. Non-venomous, from Argentina. Just hanging out. And another false coral snake. Well, we didn't get a chance to see any real coral snakes, just the false ones. It's probably for the best, because I think uh, coral snakes are like some of the most deadliest venomous snakes in the world. Correct me if I'm wrong, I know they're venomous, and I know they're venomous pretty bad. Maybe they're not deadly, but... You don't want to get bit by one, that's for sure. Hey, this guy's from California. I think that's it. It's pretty small. I mean, you know, like you can see, that's where we came in down there. Just a few snakes. Some, uh, some lizards. Three really, really gross spiders that I'm going to have nightmares about. And, uh... A very, very creaky, very creaky wooden floor. Anyway, uh, it's really hot in here, and there's like... I'm still thinking about those spiders. I gotta get out of here. Uh, listen, that's gonna be it for the video. <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed it, and even though you had to see a bunch of creepy crawlies at the end of it. And uh, stay tuned, because we're gonna have more videos coming up real soon.